You are listening to a sermon from Village Baptist Church in Petaluma. For more sermons like this one, please visit our website at villagebaptisthome.org. Our mission is to win people to Christ and develop them into active disciples. We pray this sermon is a blessing to you. Now let's hear today's message. Um, We have a few words that we need to deal with. And... uh, We're going to try and focus on those this morning. Uh, I don't believe we did prayer and fasting. We're going to start with that. Then we're going to go into uh, fellowship. We're going to go into fruit of the spirit and gifts of the spirit. We'll try and do the Holy Spirit, justification, love, miracle, Pentecost, inerrancy, inspiration, interpretation. Election, tulip, intercession, judging, and the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Are we all on the same page? Amen. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to uh, meditate upon your word, to hear your word to hear scripture this morning as we look at these important Christian words that everyone should know. We ask that you will guide us, you will help us, help us in our deliberation, help us in our discussion, help us in our give and take, help us in the question and answer period, that all this will help us to grow from faith to faith and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. For it is in his precious name we pray. Amen. 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 So prayer and fasting. That will be the next word we look at. Prayer and fasting. Prayer. When we look at the disciples' cross, we notice that prayer is one way in the disciples cross we have the vertical and then we have the horizontal the vertical talks about the word of god the word the bible this is how god speaks to us this is primarily how god speaks to us i am not saying that god does not speak to us through other believers. There is the word of prophecy that can come from other believers. That could be, you know, other things that come from other believers. But because we are human, sometimes we abuse our gifting. And we tend to tell people what we want to tell them and not what God wants to tell them. Or what God is telling them. So it is important that we understand that the Bible is the word of God. And it is where we receive our supreme authority when it comes to matters of faith and practice. When it comes to what we believe, faith, and what we do, practice. It comes from the word of God. And the word of God is very clear. So you cannot tell me God told you something if it contradicts the word of God. Immediately somebody tells me that God told them something that I know is against the word of God. It's a clear indication that it is not from God but from the evil one. We have to be very careful when we tell people what we think God is telling them. We have to make sure it's in line with what God has already revealed. If it is against what God has already revealed, we should keep it to ourselves. Because the spirit of the prophet is what? Subject to the prophet. You have to be very careful that you're not telling people what God did not tell you. For example, if God tells you 
that you should tell Dick and Roy he should not wear a cap in the church. <laughs> okay, we know that that may be tradition. It's not from the word of God. I remember when the ushers in Marine City used to tell young people coming to our church, they can't come in with that cap on. I said, why? And they just look at me like that. It's, it's not holy. Who told you that? Is it from the word of God? Did you get it from the word of God? No. Leave them alone. So we have to make sure we don't make things up. I remember I challenged Dick and Allen a few years ago. I don't know how long ago. Dick and Allen, if you remember this, uh, he did a quote to me real quick and sharp. Plainliness is next to godliness. I said, where do you get that from, Deacon? He said, from the Bible. <laughs> I said, no, it's not in the Bible. And there are a lot of things that we hear people say that are religious. But they're not from God. They're not the word of God. They may be good. But that doesn't mean, something good does not mean it is a guideline for you as a Christian. What is a guideline for you as a Christian is what God says. Amen? Amen? So prayer is how we talk to God. You see, I went all on the word when I should be focusing on prayer. Okay, so the word is how God speaks to us. Prayer is how we talk to God. Amen? Amen. Please, if you come to Village Baptist Church, I hope you will never say, I cannot pray in public because I don't know how to pray. Just because you heard somebody say, oh, mighty Savior, the rock of all ages, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the unmoved mover, I stretch my hands out to you. Doesn't mean that's prayer. Could be a lot of words that mean absolutely nothing. Prayer is talking to God. Prayer is talking to God. If you are a child of God, you ought to learn how to talk to him in your own way, not in somebody else's way. And how do you learn to pray to God? Read the Psalms. Be familiar with the Psalms. But don't limit yourself to the Psalms. Read the word of God. And read prayers of saints, prayers of Paul, prayers of Peter, prayers of David, prayers of Moses. Get familiar with them. And you will learn how to talk to God. Above all, be familiar with the, one of the most important prayers in the Bible. We call it the Lord's Prayer, but it is not really the Lord's Prayer. It is our prayer. The Lord's Prayer is actually found in John chapter 17. Our Father who art in heaven is what God is teaching us. The disciples said, teach us how to pray. When you pray, say this, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will 
be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Amen. We say it differently than the Catholics do. What? Okay. <laughs> Amen. But the point is this. If you learn it, you will learn the pattern that you ought to use when you pray to God. It's not just repeating that prayer that is a prayer to God. It's learning how to do it. Praise him first. And then ask him what you need. And he says, you don't have because. But the one thing we learn in the New Testament and in the Old Testament is that prayer goes hand in gloves with what? Fasting. Fasting. Some things cannot be done. Some things cannot be obtained. Something cannot be received without fasting. Jesus said that I didn't. And I believe his words. The disciples says, why can't we do this? Because some things cannot be done, cannot be received without fasting. Prayer and fasting going together. So as a Christian, practice fasting. Not just when the church asks for it or when we declare it that we want to do it, but practice fasting so that you do it on a regular basis. I don't know. I think the Catholics fast on Fridays. Those of you that used to be good Catholics. <laughs> On Friday, they don't eat meat. All right. When do we Baptists give up food? Interestingly enough, the root meaning of fast is going so fast that you forgot to. There should be days when you look at the time, it's four o'clock, and all you've been doing is reading the Bible and praying to God. You haven't even thought about food. That's true fasting. I didn't give you any opportunity to say anything on that. But the disciples cross helps us a lot. Where do we get the scripture from that tells us about denying ourselves? Huh? Go ahead. Luke 9, 23. What does it say, Deacon? If any man will come after me. What, would, what is he supposed to do? Deny himself. Take up his cross daily, daily, daily and follow me. Amen. Etienne, give one point to Deacon. Deacon Hairston. All right. Any, any other thing? We're going to move on to fellowship. Any other thing on prayer and fasting? Do you have a quick question on prayer and fasting? No? Okay. I'm glad you didn't ask. I may not have been able to answer it. They can hunt. It looks like I may need you too. Maybe this side or that side. They're not. Yeah. Fellowship. 
Fellowship. Who can, when you think of fellowship, the word fellowship, who can think of the most important passage in the New Testament that deals with fellowship? The most, yes, no, no. Chapter 2, verses 40 something. 41 through 47. Did you say 47? Oh, you didn't say anything. Okay. Acts chapter 2, <laughs> verses 41 through 47. Please give Shante a point. Okay. When you think about Christian fellowship, that is the first passage that should come to your mind. This was the beginning of the New Testament church. This was how they did fellowship. All those who believed in the teachings of the apostles came together and they devoted themselves to what? The apostles teaching to breaking bread together and to prayer and they shared everything in common so that there were no needy people among them. Then you jump to Acts chapter 4. It prolongs it or extends it and tells you how the New Testament church fellowship together. The word fellowship is the Greek word koinonia. And the basic meaning of koinonia is what? Huh? No. To share. Have in common. Who said have in common? Makila, give Makila a point, please. Have in common. Having common mean all those cars you parked outside, they don't belong to you. Amen. That's true communion. Nobody claimed that anything belonged to them. Even houses and lands they sold them and brought the proceeds to the apostles so that it can be distributed to those who have needs. That's true koinonia. Yes, Cheryl. Sir, so you mean that I can ask um, Brother Atheon for the key to his food Uh, Elon Musk. <laughs> Amen. Just, just tell him the Lord told you. <laughs> yes. So, would we say that now, uh, in this time, what it would look like for us is someone like, not to say that we can borrow his Tesla, but if we were, say we were taking the kids someplace, and then the pond said, yeah, you can use our van. It could be both. It could be both. That's, now, let me tell you, let me tell you something. A lot of people may not tell you this. America is what it is today because of Christian generosity. It is amazing that it is specifically in America that non-profits actually rule the country, not the government. It's what little tiny churches like Village Baptist Church do in their communities. 
Yes. Correct, correct. Let us not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Uh, that has to do with, of course, you cannot meet together if you're not together and you're not sharing. Amen. It's a spur one another toward love and good deeds. Good deeds. Especially as we do what? As we see the day approaching. We, don't, we should not do it less. We should do it more. And more and more. Amen. Amen. We move to the fruit of the spirit. You know I've spent Sundays to do this. I'm just doing a review with you today. Fruit of the spirit. Where can we get the passage on the fruit of the spirit? Yes. Okay, all right, we'll give it to you. Uh, give Shalina one point. <laughs> Galatians 5. Okay, the fruit of the Spirit. Can you mention any of the? Yes. Okay, uh, what is the important thing about the fruit of the Spirit? Love. Notice it said fruit, not fruits of the Spirit. It said the fruit of the Spirit. What comes out when you are in Christ? When you are in Christ and you are in the spirit, because you cannot be in Christ and not be in the spirit. The Holy Spirit is not just in the holy roller churches. The Holy Spirit is present wherever Christians are present. Because Christians are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. That is how you know that you are a Christian. That you are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. You are controlled by the Holy Spirit. You are led by the Holy Spirit. You walk in the Holy Spirit. And because you do so, you produce the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And love produces a lot of things. And that's what the scripture is trying to say. Joy, peace, gentleness, kindness, and all. Okay. Because against such, there's no law. What about the gifts of the spirit? What do we mean? By the gifts of the Spirit. When you are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, you are led by the Holy Spirit, and you walk in the Holy Spirit, and thank you, and the Holy Spirit indwells you, you automatically have what? The gifts of the Spirit, or gift of the Spirit. I heard one amen though. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There are 21, at least 21 identifiable gifts of the spirit that are listed in the Bible. Listed. You don't have to guess them. They are listed. A lot of people come up with funny and ridiculous gifts that they tie to the Holy Spirit. Like I, I have the gift of dancing. 
have the gift of singing. Or have the gift of coming late to church. <laughs> Those are not gifts of the Spirit. How many people can name five legitimate gifts of the Spirit? Five. Okay. Uh, Rosalind, five. Okay, that's enough. Five. Uh, give her a point. Aaron, I saw your hand up. Okay. Is that five right there? Okay. Good. We have ten already out of 21. Okay. Uh, yes, please give her a point. Yes. Were you raising your hand? Yes, five more. We still have a lot more to go. So, uh, generosity, the gift of miracles. As uh, she said, miracles. Um, did somebody say hospitality? No, no, no go ahead. Hospitality, um, apostles. They, they said apostles. Okay. Um, uh, the gift of helps. Helps. Service. Service. Knowledge. All right. Okay. So we have 15. Who, can, who think they can give us the rest? Okay. Uh, give Shante one point. Shalina again. Wisdom. They said prophecy already, I think. Right? You haven't heard it? Okay. Prophecy. Okay. We'll take that. Exhortation. Yes, you did. You stuck? Okay, who can give us? Yes, a candle. Uh, discernment. Yes. I know it's getting real hard to think of what's left. Yes. Mercy. Yes. Yes. Faith. All right. Faith. Faith. Give Kendall two points. <laughs> Gift of faith. Now let let me let me. That what? Is there anybody sitting here that believes they have the Holy Spirit in them? They walk in the Spirit. They are led by the Spirit. They are indwelt by the Spirit. But you have no gift. Please raise your hand. You have no gift. I'm being really serious. I'm not trying to be funny. Because I have seen many people in the church <coughs> fail to serve on a team in the church because they have no gift. There should be no one who is active, regardless of your age. And when I'm talking to young people, I am not just talking to Janessa. I'm talking to everybody. There should be nobody in the church saved. Maybe some of you don't want to serve yet until you're baptized. I don't know why, but there should be nobody saved who has the gift of the Spirit 
And the Bible says it. Where can we find it in the Bible? Where it says for sure that if you are born by the Spirit of God, you have at least one gift. It's stated in at least three specific passages in the Bible. Aaron. First Corinthians chapters what? I want to give you a generous range. You don't know. Yes. No, your mom says no, so she must know the right answer. 12, 13, and 14. Okay, specifically chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, chapter 13, and chapter 14. Chapter 12 lists the gifts. Chapter 13 deals with one specific gift we're talking about two other gifts and how that gift is to be demonstrated even though you only hear about chapter 13 at weddings it was not written for a wedding first corinthians 13 was written to the church of corinth to direct them in how to use the gifts of the spirit It was not a wedding passage. And chapter 14 corrects the church in the actual use of the gift, especially when it comes to gifts that are being used wrongly in the church, specifically the gift of speaking in tongues. I go back to my original question. Why is it that we will have people in the church who claim to be Christian, indwelled by the Holy Spirit? Some of them will die if you tell them they're not Christians. But they don't serve on any team where they can demonstrate the use of the gifts that God has given to them. I'm just a messenger. Don't shoot me. The word of God is very clear that if you are indwelled by the spirit, you should be led by the spirit and you should walk in the spirit. And you, you should have at least one gift of the Holy Spirit. And we need that gift at Village Baptist Church. We need that gift in Petaluma. We need that gift in Marin County. We need that gift around the world. Whatever gift you have, you can use it to edify the body of Christ. Not just local body, but the what? Universal body of Christ. Well, we get into the next topic, which is the Holy Spirit. Who is the Holy Spirit? He is God. He is this paraclete. He's a wonderful counselor. He's the mediator. Are you sure about that? Okay. He intercedes. He's our intercessor. Mediator. Okay. Okay. The Holy Spirit is God. 
Don't refer to him as it. You're trying to be a Jehovah witness when you start doing that. You have to recognize him, the Holy Spirit, as a person. The Holy Spirit is a person. He has intellect, he has emotion, and he has will. You cannot make the Holy Spirit do what he doesn't want to do. You, can just, you cannot just command him what, when you want. We do that in the church a lot. Come here, Holy Spirit. Sometimes it's very funny because he's right next to you. He's already in you. You should be telling yourself, open yourself to the Holy Spirit instead of telling the Holy Spirit to come. Open your church service to the Holy Spirit. Open your life to the Holy Spirit. Open your congregation to the Holy Spirit. Don't tell him to come. He's already here. I am not saying the songs that say come are totally wrong. Please don't get me wrong on that. Come thou fount of every blessing. Tune my heart to sing thy praise. There's nothing wrong with asking the Holy Spirit to guide us. To lead us. But a lot of times when we're talking about come... We're talking about as if he is not here. He's already here. He's waiting for you to open up. He's waiting for you to tune your heart to him. If we come prepared knowing that the spirit is already here, we won't need a cheerleader in our worship services. Many times, some of us, we have to get somebody to shake us. Oh, I don't know which shoulder is the surgery shoulder. <laughs> shake us. Wake up. What did you come here to do? You came here to praise the Lord. You came in. You sat down. You left without even praising him. Why did you come? I am an introvert. You think the Holy Spirit cares about that? I wonder how it will be if the Holy Spirit would treat us like we treat him. Yes. We are doing it on our own agenda. Frida has been telling me lately, why are you always talking about time when you're preaching? And I'm looking at time right now too. Is that time correct? It's not correct. It's saying to 11. Somebody need to put a battery in that <laughs> clock. <laughs> the 
Holy Spirit. Any question on that? Any? I think we discussed that enough. Do, what time is it? Can somebody? 12.16. 12, 16. Okay. The next word is justification. This is one of the most important words in Christianity and you need to know it. You need to know it. Salvation is how we get saved. Salvation means you have been rescued. You have been redeemed. Your Penalty has been put on somebody else. You're no, no longer guilty. That's salvation. We are saved by the grace of the almighty God. But salvation is in three tenses. It's in the past. It's in the present. As in the, it's also in the future. I hope those of you on this side can see. Um, the past is justification. The present is sanctification. The f- Future is glorification. Now, the question. What passage in the Bible can you find this? Yes? No. You're in the right book. Who knows it? Huh? No. No. <laughs> what is the word again? You, you were you asleep? <laughs> okay. What passage in the Bible can we find it? No. Yes. No, not Romans three. It talks about what, yes? Um, those, those, those whom, justified. yes. Also, what Romans, what chapter? Uh-huh. <laughs> it's not seven and it's not nine. Eight. 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 Romans chapter eight. Uh, Specifically starting with around 28. 28. Okay. Okay, did somebody find it? You want to read it for us? Sure. Um, and we know that in the... Sorry, 28? Yeah. Okay. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be to the likeness of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. Okay. So that is the passage where you will find uh, the three parts of as our salvation. God saved us, he justified us, he sanctified us, and he glorified us. He is not waiting to do this step by step. He did it all at the same time. If you saved, you're complete. You're complete. He did it all by himself. He didn't wait on you. He did it all by himself. So it is important. Justification. Just as if I never sinned. 
Justification. Okay, let's go to love. Did we give somebody a point for that Romans chapter 8? Shante? Okay, you got the book, so you get half a point. Oh, Cheryl read it, so let's give her a point too for reading it. You're all helping me in my sermon today. All right. Uh, Shante, uh, uh, Makila, Frida, and... <laughs> I love it when you help me with my message. Love. The most abused word in the English language. Amen. <laughs> yes. You hear it at every wedding. 1 Corinthians 13, but the most important passage for love is John 3, 16 through 18. John 3, 16 through 18 is the most important passage on love. Okay. Uh, also, Romans 5, 8. God demonstrated what? His love toward us in this that why? Christ died for us. What is the most important love passage that's commanded to Christians? Okay, John 13, 34, and 35. Who said that? Reggie and Hope. Reggie, Reggie and Hope. Are you serious about that? It was Reggie and Hope. Okay, okay, give Reggie and Hope a point each. <laughs> okay, now who can tell me what the passage says? Huh? It started with A. Yes? Wait a minute, wait a minute. When I call on somebody, please, everybody don't say it. Let the person say it. Hope you were going to say it. By this, okay, love one another. Amen? Amen. 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 That's really very important. Okay. <laughs> Amen. Shalina, you want to? You're my assistant pastor today. <laughs> okay. So. The Greek word for love is agape. agape. Okay? That is the basic Greek word for love. Unfortunately, that's not the only word for love in the Greek. And we abuse love when we say we love you, but we really don't mean unconditional love. God's love is unconditional. God did not lavish his love on you because you deserve it. If you understand that, you will deal with people differently than you do now. Because God did not deal with you based on what you deserve. He is dealing with you purely on the basis of his kindness and mercy.
That's how God deals with us. That's how many of us deal with our kids. Sometimes that's why most of our kids are rotten. I, I hope uh, Dayo is not watching this uh, in Africa. But I hired somebody this past time when I went to Africa to help me with some of the work we're doing there. And I said, you'll be working with Dayo, my son, my nephew. But I raised him because my brother died before he was born. So I raised him up from young to university. <clears throat> but I told her, I said, Dio is working with you simply because of language issues. So you'll understand what people are saying, and he'll be able to interpret to you and get the message across. But do not depend on him. Yes, he has internet. <laughs> Unless my niece tells him to watch it. <laughs> and Dio needs to be saved. <laughs> I hope you'll be praying for him too. But the point I was trying to emphasize there is that my love for Dio, Dio working with me, is not based on the fact that I think he is indispensable or he's just the right man for everything I'm doing. It's because I just love him. I overlook some of the nonsense he does. <laughs> You'll be amazed how much God overlooks Amen. our faults. In the Greek, the word phileo is also used. That is translated love. Is the same word that is used for philosophy. Phileo Sophia. The love of wisdom. But it's not unconditional love. It's sort of like a, the friendship love. Sometimes when you tell me, Pastor, I love you, you probably meant I feel like oh, you. You don't really mean I agape you. Amen? Yeah. Because I have seen a lot of people who say, Pastor, I love you, and they leave this church for no reason at all. And you know they weren't using agape. Agape is the kind of love that will sustain a marriage. Amen. 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 Those of you married, yes. you know. Yes. It's agape. <laughs> Even though there is epithumia in that. <laughs> There is sorge in there. We have Philadelphia with brotherly love. But nothing compared to agape. Sometimes when you say you love somebody, you're only talking about eros. Don't say I love you, just say I eros you. Let the person, that's 
the kind of love I'd say to my wife every now and then. Say, hey, Frida, I eros you. <laughs> Let the little kids close there. <laughs> Agape is unique to those who have experienced the grace of God. Agape is a command love. Man, this time, I hate time. It goes so fast. <laughs> yes. He commands us. When he says, love one another, it's agape that is used. Yes. It's agape. Unconditional. Even to people who talk behind your back. The love of God unfathomable. You cannot understand the love of God. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. The love of God. How wide, how deep, how high. It is incomprehensible. That is the love that God showers upon us. And that is why He is a forgiven God. That's why he's a merciful God. He can be holy and just at the same time as loving. Only he can truly do that. Amen. Some of you, including me, we will lose our mind for a few minutes, a few hours, a few days. Before we we get our minds back, but well, God does not. He does not. He loved you twenty years ago when He knew what you were going to do twenty years later. And all the things in between. Thank you for listening. If you would love to hear more sermons like this one or find out more about our church, please visit us at villagebaptisthome.org. Until next time, take care and God bless.